for your for your living word uh, that you gave to us, Lord. I ask that you open our hearts and minds to what you'll have us learn from it today um, as we continue to look at this um, great study on, on work, Lord, in your name. Amen. So today we are continuing the second part of, as we look at the role of work in a Christian's life. La- quick review of last week. Um, man was made for work. All men and women should work. Work should be done to the glory of God. And work is meant to be hard. And not because we make it hard. The more one works, the more work we can do. That's basically a synopsis of last week. And the Bible clearly warns that about people who don't want to work or are unwilling to work. In 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul wrote, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And now the New Living Translation puts it this way, Even while we were with you, we gave you this command, those unwilling to work will not get to eat. I think it's a little more clear. Uh, <laughs> notice he doesn't say unable to work. And there is a difference. Paul was writing to believers in a church, who some of whom were not willing to work. And the solution was simple. Then you do not get to eat. You know, they shouldn't get the benefits. Christians should not be known as slackers or lazy people. Unable to work uh, hard. You know, what is... See, when I read that, what does it mean to be unable to work? What does that really mean? I, I think of someone like Joni Erickson Tata, who's a quadriplegic, who probably works harder than anyone here. You know, she's an artist, she's a musician, well, not a musician, a singer. Um, You know, this woman does so much, and yet without the use of her arms or her legs. Uh, And someone, you know, being unable to work almost seems like it's an oxymoron. And before you say, well, Tony Erickson or Joni Erickson Totter is exam is special. I remember probably it must be five or six years ago that we had a, a woman who had bad knees, bad hips, um, and she came to a work day and it was really well, what is she gonna do? And what she did is she would sit on the end seat here, or let me think of how it worked. She'd sit one in and she would clean the seat next to her, and then she'd hop to the next seat and clean that seat. And she worked her way literally around every seat in the, in the sanctuary cleaning them. So even someone who could barely walk can work. So, and so in a small church, everyone has to work. And yes, some have confused work with telling others how to do things. You know, it's that old line, right? You know, everyone wants to serve God, but only as a trusted advisor. Um, God has given us leaders, but as Jesus demonstrated, leaders have to serve. Others are willing to work, but they take the approach, do it as quickly as you can, and then get out of it. Just checking a box off of it. But again, that doesn't line up with Scripture. Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24 says, Whatever you do, Work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. You know, and that brought up to mind, like, how do we, I think I asked this last week, is how would you do it differently if you could see Jesus standing there as you did things for the Lord? My my friend Curry had a new roof installed uh, on his house. And these people showed up that he got the best price and, I think it must have taken him like three or four years to figure out which, who would give him the best deal for his buck. And, you know, they came, they started, they pulled off all of his old shingles, they put the new shingles, started putting them on. And my friend Kurt is not afraid to go up on a roof. Uh, with me, I'm like, I-, I trust you. I'm not going, you know, I'm not even going to look at a ladder. So he went up there and started to inspect the work they had done. Started pointing out things that were wrong called their manager, and point, they, he agreed, oh yeah, this is wrong. You know, it changed their whole way of doing things, because they knew someone was going to watch and check up on them. Uh, 
it changes your, your way. So if, if as Christians you go through life and say, hey, God's watching me, how does that change? And that's how we should be, knowing that it's God we should be doing this for. And as I said, how would you do things differently if you could see Jesus there? I know of two Sunday school teachers. One would literally read the lesson as they came into class. They would sit there and read it and then try and tell people, the, the students, what they just read. Another person would come in two days before and run through the class multiple times by themselves so that they would have it flow just right. Trying to see how each part flowed together. Who was doing it unto the Lord? And who was not? You know, I think that's fairly obvious. So today I want to look at three more things. Number one, work is better and sometimes, but not always, easier when done with others. It's not always easier. <laughs> work is always better when we actively involve Jesus in our work. And work done without Jesus is downright fruitless and will become much harder. Now, as I said, for some, work is a four-letter word. One that you don't talk about in proper company. Frankly, it is something that we should be known for. Christians should be known for how hard we work. And no, the work will not be done until we see the Lord. You will never get to a spot where God says to you, you've done enough, you've done your time, you don't, I don't require any more work of you. Let's flip over to Luke 17. Luke 17. Look at verses 7 to 10. Jesus is talking. And he says, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you have, were commanded, say we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you get a free ride. You know, there's a, a heresy that says, just say the prayer and then live the life in the world. It doesn't work that way. If you can continue to live your life in the world without struggles, without, you know, concern about your sin, that prayer is just words you said. Clearly our work isn't going to stop. Our service to the Lord will continue even after you've been working in the fields. This commitment goes on our whole life. There's no retirement for Christians. And I also don't want to upset you, but even when we're in heaven, I believe that there's going to be work for us to do. Do you think that we're just going to sit around all the time and do nothing for eternity? That would be kind of boring. Well, we're going to worship God. Absolutely. But again, think of man in the garden. The Bible says that man in the garden was put there to work. What? Until. Until, okay. Now, the man and woman were put there in the garden to work it. And yes, there was no weeds and there were no thorns, but they still had to work. Work was not the result of sin. But the toil that comes from work is. So because man had to work before sin, why do we think that when we get to heaven, we won't be given jobs to do? I don't know what that will amount to. I don't know what it's like. But I think if, if we were working in the garden, we're going to be working in heaven. Now I will say, work can be better with others around you. But better, again, does not necessarily mean easier. The passage that got us to this topic of work is when Paul came in from Corinth. And now flip over to Acts 18. Now as I said, as if we have verses that are you know, three verses or more, we'll probably I'll ask you to jump to it. It's good for your fingers, fights arthritis, you know, builds calluses. 
So, Acts 18, verses 1 to 4. After Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius has command, had commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So again, Paul comes from Athens, where he had been doing the work of the ministry there by himself. It was, when viewed from the outside, it was probably not a very prosperous missions trip. As we saw last week, only a few people came to salvation that we know of. And being all alone probably made it even worse. Has anyone ever worked on a job just by yourself? And you're, you know, you're, you're, maybe you're in a cubicle, maybe you're, you know, you're working a late night shift. You know, at Radio Shack, we used to do our inventories at night, and sometimes you'd be in a section of the store just by yourself, just counting. And two always follow, uh, comes before three, and it gets very boring. Um, but he was by himself. And probably felt even worse. He had no one to talk to, no one to encourage him. Paul couldn't see the hearts of, that would change in Athens by the gospel, but God did. And as we saw last week, Paul made the 53-mile journey down to Corinth, and there he finds a couple who became tied to him, whether it was in a tent-making shop or in the ministry later on. But God not only introduced Paul to new friends, he returns old friends to him too in verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was, was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. Can you imagine how Paul must have felt? Yes, as we'll see, the church in Corinth would vex him at times, especially when you start to read uh, First and Second Corinthians. But he stayed there for a year and a half. He had friends both old and new there, and that makes a huge difference. Just as we saw last week that man was made for work, man also was not meant to be alone. Remember when God, when, why God created woman in Genesis 2.18? Remember how this God described her? As a helper. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now, you, if you have the old King James, it's a help meet. Um, and while part of the curse for man's re re ugh, part of the curse for man's rebellion was found in jo Genesis three sixteen, he said to the woman, "I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you." That last part of the curse was a prophecy of both feminism and chauvinism, where each sex t attempts to dominate the other. But that's not how it was supposed to be in the beginning. God recognized our need for help. Even in the garden, God saw our need and desired to fill it. Before I go any further, I, I want to look at that word helper. How, what do you think of when you think of someone as being a helper? If I said to you, who would you rather fix your car, a mechanic's helper or a mechanic? Who would you take? A mechanic, probably. Um, you know, you, you trust a helper to change the oil, maybe uh, replace your brakes, maybe. Um, but in general, you trust a mechanic more because he's not a helper. Or how about a mother's helper, who's generally a child? who was basically a gopher for the mother as she went about her daily job. You know, so, and I know that there are good mechanics helpers who probably know more, just like there's physician's assistants who know more than doctors, it seems, or better to see. Um, but generally, that's not how it goes. And unfortunately, that's the view of helper. Some, when people read about women, uh, women being man's helper, that's how they look at it. As a person, they're helping. And, um, you know, it's a limitation of our language. And it shouldn't be used to demean a person. 
Being someone's helper certainly doesn't make them less of a person they help. Someone who knows more or is better able, you know, to work than a helper. And that's unfortunately an evil and errant belief that's crept into churches, that women being uh, were created as man's helper is somehow less than man. And that all women should be subservient to men. And I've been to churches where there was an undercurrent of that. You know, no. No. Men and women are on the same team. You know, here's the funny thing. I decided to look at that word, <coughs> that word helper. In the Hebrew word, it's azer. And I find out very interesting where else in the Bible azer is used. And who else it's used to describe. Has anyone ever done this? To look at who, who else is a helper? Okay. Look at three sections, three uh, Psalms. Psalm 33, 20. <clears throat> our soul waits for the Lord. He is our azer, our help and our shield. Psalm 70, verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my azer, my help, and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Psalm 146, verses 5 to 6. Blessed is he whose help, azer, is the Lord of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord, his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. The same word for helper is translated as our help. So, while God is our helper, that does not make Him our servant. Though I've heard people pray like He is. God, you have to do this for me. God, do that. Uh, God, I want this to go away. No. Likewise, women were not given to men to be our lackeys or to wait upon man. And they certainly are not less than men. She was meant to help him and frankly complete him. To see our blind spots. When Trace and I will talk about things, you know, I'll say something that looks so obvious and then she'll say, but have you considered? Oh, hmm, okay, no, I haven't. And likewise, men should be doing the same thing for women. Now the Bible says, it does say that man is the spiritual head of his family. In church, men fill leadership offices of elder or pastor and deacon, not because they're better, but because God's word says in 1 Timothy 2, Verses 12 to 14, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Partnering with others goes beyond the bond of a man or a woman in marriage. It's something that we should be doing as we walk along the narrow path. You may not be married today. You may not be married ever, but when you're in church, you can partner with people. I really think that when we have committees in our church, that it should be made up of both men and women for that same reason, that men and women see things very differently. Um, and they approach problems very differently. I, when I was a project leader down in Dutchess. I had men and women on my teams, and always... They would they would work very differently from one another, and we and when we sit down and talk, they each brought something good to the table. So, so we are made to work, and when we work, having someone with us just makes the work go better. As we learned in our, one of our past men's studies, you know, Jethro realized that Moses wasn't doing working smart, you know. Remember, the, here they were in the wilderness. Remember how, uh, and men, you can correct me if I'm misremembering this, but I hope I'm not. They're in the wilderness, and what was Moses doing in the wilderness as far as you know, hearing people's complaints? Was he? He did it all. You're not a man. <laughs> so, yeah, he did it all. He was hearing everyone's complaints, and, and remember his... his his, his father-in-law, Jethro, came to him and said, you know, this is not good. <laughs> and he, he gave him advice. And, and, you know, because hearing two million people's complaints, you know, you know that's hard. Um, in fact, 
in Exodus 18, and we won't go there, but Exodus 18, verses 17 to 23, his, this is not good. And actually, actually, let's go there, because it is Exodus 18. We haven't done Old Testament today. Exodus 18. Starting in verse 17. This is not good, Moses' father-in-law exclaimed. You are going to wear yourself out. I'm reading from the New Living, um, just because I like the thought for thought in this. You're going to wear yourself out, and the people too. This job is too heavy a burden for you to handle all by yourself. Now listen to me, and let me give you a word of advice. And may God be excuse me, with you. You should continue to teach the people's representative before God, bringing their disputes to him. Teach them God's decrees and give them his instructions. Show them how to conduct their lives. But select from all the people some capable, honest men who fear God and hate bribes. Appoint them as leaders over groups of 1,000, 100, 50, and 10. They should always be available to solve the people's common disputes, but have them bring their major cases to you. Let the leaders decide the smaller matters themselves. They will help you carry the load, making the task easier for you. If you follow this advice, and now this is important, and if God commands you to do so, then you will be able to endure the pressures and all these people will go home in peace. Notice, Jethro doesn't say, do this and just get it done. Or, what are you, stupid? He says, no, this is not good. And even when he gives his advice, he goes, this is my advice, but only do it if God tells you to. You know, so there's that line. Human wisdom is not wisdom compared to God. So he says, you can't handle it. And it was going to hurt the people too. So he's, it's called delegating work to others, which is important. And notice Moses was still involved. And so, yes, there are times when we are called to serve individually before God. Paul in Athens was a case in point. He went there. He served. Another man, Joshua. Remember, he was the guy that replaced Moses as leader of the Israels. Talk about shoes to fill. But not just lead. Remember what Moses was going to do. He was going to go lead the Israelites into the promised land. That was the thing that Moses was supposed to do. But it, Moses lost that job because he sinned in anger. But remember what God said to Joshua over and over again. Joshua 1.9 This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And likewise, when Paul was in Athens, yeah, it might appear he was by himself, but he knew that God was with him. The fact that even when a Christian is called into a ministry by him or herself, they are never really alone. God is with them. Think of Elijah. This, this feeling of being alone can be overwhelming. He just defeated 400 prophets of Baal. But when the queen threatened his life, he ran away. And he ran away, as we learned a couple weeks ago, because he thought he was the only follower of Christ le of God left. And sometimes you and I too can feel that way. I have to preserve myself. I'm the last person who believes in God. But just as God ultimately revealed to Elijah that there were 7,000 people who didn't bow the knee to, him, uh, to Baal, God wasn't worried. God made preparations to turn over Elijah's ministry to Elisha. Still, when you look in the Bible, people are generally more comfortable with having someone alongside them. Remember, again, Moses. What was the last thing that uh, he wanted? Like, when it, What was the last thing that God let him do in order to get Moses moving? You remember? Who? Aaron, his brother. Yeah, he says, here comes... Isn't that Aaron, your brother, coming? Okay, he can come too, and he'll be the speaker. Uh, but it was just an excuse because later on in Hebrews it says that Moses was a powerful speaker. You know, 
But he was just looking for, I just don't want to go, so I'm going to come up with any excuse I can, even if it's to God. Um, so, remember when Jesus sent out the 12 disciples? Um, flip over to Luke 9. If you're in Exodus, just start turning. Luke 9. Luke 9, he didn't send them out individually. He sent out the 12. Luke 9, verses 1, and then we'll go down to 6. And he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter in, stay there, and, and from there depart. And wherever you do not receive, they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through all the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. He just wanted them to go, proclaim the gospel, and as proof, heal them. In, in Mark's account of that same passage, in Mark 6.12, he adds, and tell them to repent of their sins. Now, again, we don't know the culture as well, but Jesus sent these men out into the land of Judah, which is in the southern kingdom. All but one disciple was from the northern kingdom, Galilee, and so they were looked at like eyes being from the sticks. You know, like, like when you hear someone from the south talk, you know, you always come up with this, Im oh, sorry, Tim. <laughs> Ah, uh, he's got a New York accent now anyway, so, you know. But that's how they were looked at. They were looked at as like little, like, uh, are they hokums? You know, hoagies or whatever they're called down in West Virginia. Um, you know, all except Judas Iscariot was the only one from the southern tribe, uh, from Judah. Most of these men were uneducated common people, as we saw. Yet Jesus empowered them to do mighty works and miracles. And Jesus sent them out, not really giving them any time to prepare. Because I think, I think he didn't want them to second guess what they were doing. We're going to go out into the southern kingdom. We know how people feel about the, us here. You know, wooders and kudas can always sidetrack missions. But when they returned, they told Jesus all that they had done. So here's Jesus sending them out 12 at a time. You know, one group out is closest. But then later on, in Luke 10, he sends out 72 more disciples. It's a different mission strip. Same message. Look at uh, Luke 10, verses 1 to 11. Just one chapter over. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Again, notice, they had the one person, only had one person with them. They weren't supposed to bring money. No extras. You know, they wanted to greet people on the way, and that didn't mean that you walk by, you just put your head up. And it, it was a little clarification. A lot of times you'd meet people, and they felt obligated to start talking to you. And conversations can just lead to invitations to homes, and in Eastern culture, you would have to be obligated to go. It was like you could say hi, but you don't want to go stay at their house. You know, again. This was a sense of urgency in Jesus' ministry. And he gives them specific tasks to do in verse 5. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if it not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. 
So they were going into towns, into homes, accepting whatever they were offered. They were not supposed to shop around and say, well, I like the bed over here, but this person can really cook. You know, you, you, no, you went wherever you went, you stayed. If they serve you sardine stew in a crock pot every day, that's what you eat with a smile. They were to eat and drink whatever was provided because it wasn't the people providing. It was God providing for them. And Jesus as well equipped them to do miracles. And if they were received from the town, they were given the power to heal along with their message that the healing was done because the kingdom of God was at hand. Imagine how this must have felt to them as they went out. And Jesus, but Jesus knew not every town would accept them. So he adds this caveat in verses 10 to 12. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of our ta your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. He says, okay, if the town doesn't receive you, just wipe the dust off your feet, but still proclaim the message. The kingdom of God has come near you. And he gives a warning that it's going to be more tolerable for a, a city like Sodom that was wiped off the face of the earth because of their sin than for the people who reject Jesus' followers. And it appears these men went out and they had an amazing response. You know, just like when uh, they came back in verses 17 to 20, it says, The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. These disciples will come back. Look what we can do. Look what we can do. Like little kids, no doubt. And Jesus gently corrects them. Earthly accomplishments are not the things that we should seek after. No matter how amazing they may appear to be. Instead, Jesus points them to a much better thing. A thing that they could not see. A thing that they probably couldn't even understand at this point that their names are recorded in heaven. Jesus is not impressed by our accomplishments. After all, he's the source of our power. Another team that went out later on was Paul and Barnabas, being pulled out by God from the church to plant churches in Gentile land. Gentiles who detested Jews and Jews who detested Gentiles. In fact, there are many instances of God sending people out, sometimes in pairs, sometimes singly. We must be careful that just because amazing things are being done, it does not automatically mean that God is involved. Flip over to Genesis 11. Genesis all the way at the beginning. Here we see an amazing thing being done without God's uh, help. And we'll read verses 1 to 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and butum, which is slime, for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down and saw the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. The Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel. 
because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. So this is after the flood. Everyone spoke the same language. The people wanted to build a city and a tower, and it says to make a name for themselves so that they would be remembered, so that they wouldn't be dispersed. They had a common goal. So they had this universe, let's just build a city here. Let's build a tower. Uh, and it got everyone working together. Please understand that while my, man can do amazing things when they work together, again, building a city and a tower that reaches the heavens, man's accomplishments pale in comparison to what God can do. While man can split the atom, God can make the atom. And God frowned on the idea of them reaching into heavens with their brick tower. And he scattered them physically, confused their language so that all the languages came together at that point, or came apart. You see, they weren't trying to do the city to honor God, but to honor themselves. And when we honor ourselves, we always fail to honor God. Remember, whatever we do has to be done as unto the Lord. But looking at this tower, it probably looked amazing. The city probably looked amazing but didn't involve God, so it meant nothing. Work done without involving Jesus is downright fruitful, fruitless. Flip over to Matthew 8. Matthew 8, verses 18 to 27. Now when the Lord saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said, Follow me, and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, Jesus tells the disciples to get in a boat and, let's, and get going, but in the meantime, he gets interrupted. You know, a number of men, a scribe who was essentially a lawyer for scriptures, comes to him and says, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, you know, to follow me isn't what you're used to. That means you have to leave the things behind, like things like big houses, fancy chariots, no big parties. These were things that the, the, the leaders, in the, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all came to accept, that if you were... A Pharisee, you should be rich because that means God's blessing you. And Jesus is like saying, no, that's not true. The Son of Man has none of those things. He doesn't even have a place to lay his head. You know. And another one comes up to him and says he has to bury his father, but the, the phrase actually means you know, he wanted to follow Jesus, but only after his father died so he could collect his inheritance. And Jesus says, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. He says to the young man, follow me. Jesus sees their hearts. He recognizes their commitment was only on the surface. Alluding to what one of the costs of following Jesus was, um, Pope, um, Matthew wants to make sure that people understand. So in verse 23, And when he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. Remember, Jesus said to him, we're going to the other side. But now they start going, and a storm comes up. The waves are going in the boat, and I've been told that when waves get in the boat, that's not a good thing. I'm not a, a fisherman. But water in a boat is bad. But their minds were not on what Jesus said to them. The storm threatened to sink their boat. In verse 25, Matthew continues, and they went and woke him, saying, Save us, we are perishing. Mark records a little more faithless than just save us, we're perishing. In Mark 4, verse 38, But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion, and they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? No wonder Matthew left that part out. Don't you care that we're perishing? Wow. Then again, I wonder how many times that we've said such a thing in our midst of our storms. Verse 26 of Matthew says, And he said to them, 
Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and sea obey him? It opened the eyes to the power of Jesus. Again, here were twelve. Most of them were fishermen. They were told by Jesus, we're going to go to the other side. But all it took was a storm to spring up. And instead of focusing on Jesus' words that we were going to the other side, they allowed that massive storm to consume their attention and to doubt their Lord's love for them. Had they remembered the words of Christ, it would have still been hard, but not impossible. They wouldn't have woken Jesus. Later, Jesus would constantly tell what was going to happen in Jerusalem. Remember that? Every time he said, we're going to Jerusalem, there the Son of Man is going to be killed by the, 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 the rulers of the temple. He's going to be turned over to the Gentiles. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. And he's going to die. And how do you always end it? Three days later, he will, I will rise again. Had they been listening all that time, they may not have been, they would have been waiting with anticipation for Jesus to return. But they didn't hear. So we need to bring Jesus along and, and remember what he said to us. And then finally, work is always better when we actively involve him. Let's flip over to John 6. Another time on the Sea of Galilee. John 6, starting in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and started across the sea of, to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. We read the previous verses last week. Uh, this is after the feeding of the 5,000. We saw that Jesus stayed behind to disperse the crowd, and they wanted to make him king. And remember, he went, got away, and he went up to the top of the mountain. And so it says here that they set out the... Uh, disciples set out it was evening and the word for evening there means late afternoon or just as night was about to fall actually it literally means second e or before second evening um so think probably five to six p.m time frame and as often happens the sea of galilee another storm comes up you got to remember the sea of galilee is 750 feet below sea level and at the northern end of it are mountains that are like 2,000 feet high so what happens is the cold air from the top of the mountains comes down, hits the warm air of the sea, and boom, it creates storms, massive storms. That's why you always read about uh, storms there. So here they are in the boat by themselves, and a storm brews. Verse 18, the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat, and they were frightened. <laughs> Always love that picture. So it's a doozy of a storm again. They'd rowed three or four miles, and, and you might say, well, that's a lot to be rowing. You know, three or four miles in an open sea, that's a long way to go. And it does sound like a lot. I mean, you know, you row for three or four miles without a, a motor or a sail. You know, but Mark gives us a little more precise time that this all happened. He says in Mark 6:48, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. Okay, so we know when did they say they started hitting the sea? Around five or six, and they were. Mark says they were in the fourth watch when Jesus walked out to them after they had gone three or four miles. Who knows what the fourth watch is? Uh, uh it's longer than that. The fourth watch is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. So they've been rowing for about 12 hours, and they got three to four miles in a stormy sea. And then... They look out, and here comes Jesus just walking like no one's business. You know, and it, it, they, uh, Mark says it's kind of like he's going to walk on by. Like, uh, see you guys, I'm going to just keep on going. And you know, he says to them, you know, 
it is I, do not be afraid. And at this point, Mark fo- turns the focus to Peter, and this is where Peter walks on the water. But Mark concludes at what happened. They were glad uh, to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they are going. So, 12 hours by themselves without Jesus, 3 to 4 miles. Jesus on board, Mark records that they were immediately to the land where they were going. So you see, just being together is not enough. Without Jesus, the storms of life can still swamp our boats, still give fear to those working together, still make very little headway as we struggle. But if we don't have Jesus, we're just fruitlessly struggling trying to get to some place. So how do we apply all this? I feel I need to point out a help is a help only if it helps. A wise man once said that to me. There are some people who pin all their happiness on having a helper. If only I had a husband or if only I had a wife, I would be so much better. And while they help, a wife or a spouse, husband could be a help, it's not always true. It's not always better. It's definitely more complex. Um, sometimes people have an unrealistic idea of what a spouse will do for them or what would be expected of them by their spouse. So God brings, if God brings a spouse into your life, great, fantastic, a helper. But if he chooses not to, great, fantastic. Remember what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7. Let's flip over to 1 Corinthians. And I really feel led to talk about these things because in a society where kids are allowed to choose their orientation, you know, it makes no sense. You know, or, you know, I, I'm going to be this, or I'm going to be... Th- no. And, and people feel, have unrealistic expectations because you see on TV or you see in the movies what, you know, sp- the ideal spouse is like, but you see him in a one-hour clip. I can be good for an hour. Can I? All right, got an hour. Maybe, <laughs> maybe two, I can I'll, I'll keep it together for two. But... <laughs> But I will make mistakes. I will stumble. I will make Tracy's life more complex just like she makes mine. So, it's true. Uh, you better admit it, Tim. Or <laughs> but starting in verse 32 of 1 Corinthians 7, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord. How to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about the worldly things. How to please his wife. His interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord. How to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things. How to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit. Not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your individual undivided devotion to the Lord. Again, if you don't have a spouse today, focus on the Lord, how to please Him. If He provides you a spouse, your focus is naturally going to be to that person and your family, but it still needs to be focused on God. So it becomes harder because you're focused on, on God, but you also feel need to focus on, on your family. And that's why Jesus said that our love for God must make all other love seem like hatred. We should look to work to others. Not as a way of pointing off work to others and just saying, hey, you do this. We'll work together. Hey, you take care of all this stuff. I'll take the credit. No. Ecclesiastes 4, 9-12 says, Two are better than one because they have good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. When you are out serving the Lord, whether it's in the church or outside the church, it's good to partner with someone else for many reasons. Working together in the fields of the Lord is always rewarding. 
You can keep each other uh, in the ministry, but you can also comfort one another when the way gets hard. When your spiritual road seems to be getting darker and darker and going uphill more and more, it's nice to have someone along with you. But as I said, it will not always be easier when you work with others. Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron as one man's countenance sharpens another. When you sharpen iron with iron, sparks fly. Paul and Barnabas, remember they were partners on that first missionary trip. It was so successful. When they started to go for the second one, remember there was a heated disagreement. I want to take John Mark. Oh, no, we're not. You know, it caused them to split up. And yes, as we earlier saw in our previous studies, they reconciled. In fact, in his last days, Paul asked for John Mark to come to him. He was useful to him. He was a helper to him. No church is going to no church is going to be without sparks. You know, when I went from by working for myself to working with a team of developers when I worked down in the county, it was a shock to me because when I worked by myself, I knew the best way to do things because no one would argue with me. Uh, it just worked. I knew the best. I knew how to do it. I knew how to lay things out. No one told me about naming fields this way or that way. There was no discussion. We just did it. We did so much faster. Then I got put on a team of other people. And, you know, they didn't see things my way all the time. They didn't take into account how smart I was because they were equally smart or smarter. It caused more work and more overhead at the time, but it was a growing experience. So when you work with someone, it's good to keep your ears open to what people are saying. I think it's called listening. You know, sometimes we just want to shout people down or talk them down so that you don't have to listen, but we have to. Likewise, sometimes you'll be tempted to work on your own because that way you don't have to deal with people. But if you're called to godly work, even when you're by yourself, it's to bring God glory. If not, you have, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Again, working with others doesn't mean just telling them what to do. Jesus demonstrated what it means to lead uh, is to serve. Ah, flip over to John. John 13. John 13, starting in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Just love that. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist and then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel they had wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Jesus took the role of the very lowest, lowest slave. In a land of sandals, bare feet, horses, donkeys, and camels, washing someone's feet was probably the most disgusting job in the world because you don't know what's between those toes. That's why Peter was incredulous. How? You're the Messiah. You're not supposed to do this. You want to wash my feet? And Peter tries to dig his heels in in verse 8. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, if I do not wash your feet, you have no share with me. Imagine how Jesus' words must have slapped Peter right in the face. Jesus was giving them an example. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean. But not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said not all of you were clean. Now, understand this. Jesus not only washed the disciples' feet, he washed Judas Iscariot's feet. The guy that was going to betray him, 
he washed his feet. Now he's dealing with the filth on the outside of his feet. He's dealing with the filth on the heart of this man. When he washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to him, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. <clears throat> Again, Jesus always has a reason for what he did, and he didn't want his disciples to be bossy, spoiled brats. Remember at this point, they were always arguing, who's the greatest? You know, I'm going to be the greatest. Even two of them got their mommy to come in and try and talk Jesus and to give him seats of power. He wanted them to be aware that in God's economy, it's not about who's in charge. And if Jesus the Messiah could wash their feet, they should be willing to work in wherever he, they go. When can you help a fellow believer wash the stink of this world off of them? It's when you come to church. When you come over to their house and the person is worn out from the battles that they fought. Um, Twyla Paris has a song, The Warrior is a Child. You know, speaks very highly of this. You know, they don't, you don't see the battles that people are fighting. And lastly, we have to remember that when we are going through those battles, we have to remember Jesus' promises. If he said we're going to get to the other side, we're going to get to the other side. Even when our lives to be, seem to be sinking into the abyss, have you ever researched and written down promises that Jesus has made to us, made to you? Ever thought of the promises God has made? So that when the storms of life seem to be sounding your doom, your boat's filling with water. You can remember. Here's one. How about Matthew 28, 18-20? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Your boat may be sinking, but Jesus is right there with you. Your boat may be going the wrong way, maybe spinning in circles, but He's there. You have to seek Him. And to seek Him and to find Him, you have to seek Him with your whole heart. He promised you the Holy Spirit if you're truly born again. John 16, verses 7-10. to 10. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send Him to you. And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see Me no longer. While Jesus is interceding on our behalf before the Father, we have the Holy Spirit as a down payment because the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is now in us. Jesus needs to be actively involved in any ministry of this church. I don't care if, if you're cleaning bathrooms. If Jesus is involved in that ministry, what are you doing it for? Well, I'm doing it so it looks clean. You're a Christian. Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. Do you have a bad attitude about, oh, I don't want to do this work? It's not the attitude of a Christian. Because while we go through struggle and strain, try and do everything on our own, especially in a small church, if we try and do everything on our own, I bet you with the people we have here, we can do a lot. But there'll be no joy. We need Jesus to kickstart the faint-hearted. He can deliver us to where we need to be. We just need to ask Him to come in the boat. And we need to make room for Him. And yes, like those men and women who made the Tower of Babel. Many churches say, look great on the outside. Oh, we have 5,000 people attending. We have a Starbucks in our lobby. Reclining seats. Oh, soft seats. Actually, they have something called padding. I don't know, it wasn't invented when these seats were made. Uh, they have amazing cathedrals. Uh, someone once made a cathedral out of, they called it the Crystal Cathedral. And eventually that church went bankrupt. 
and it was sold to another church. But if you do all these things without Christ, it's just works of animated sand. Other churches will focus on knowledge. Oh, we need pastors with an alphabet after their names. But they never learn to apply what they know. And, and we won't go there. But Matthew 7, 24-27, Jesus said, if, if anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it, it's like a man who builds a house on a rock. And when the storms come, it will stand. It won't fall over. But someone who just listens, he says, when the storms come, the house will fall. Now, with all this talk about work, some people may have come to believe that they truly are unable to work. And they'll say, (laughs) they look at their atrophied faith that can barely move them into church, much less move a mountain, and say, how can I share something so weak with others? That's one of the beauties of faith. Like our bodies, the more we use it, the more it grows. The more we study God's Word. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes from hearing. That is, hearing the good news about Christ. If your faith is small, study God's, the Gospel of Christ more and apply it to your life. Don't try to run. Walk. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Finally, one of the reasons we come to church, preferably in person, is to build relationships with God and to build relationships with each other. One last passage, Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Verses 24 to 27. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approach drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. We come to church, yes, to learn what Christ wants us to learn, but to stir one another up to love and good works. We don't come to church to rattle people's cages. We come to church to encourage one another. Other workers in the field that may be further down or further up the line from us, who may begin to focus on the size of the field they're in, who may begin to become helpless in a situation because of all that's going on around them. It's when we know our fellow workers that we can share with them what we're going through, that they're not alone. Share and push them forward. That remind them some of God's promises to us. And they may be promises that the person's heard a thousand times, but when they hear it coming out of another person's mouth, as they apply it, they go, oh, that's right. Praise God. Or if someone comes and says, you know, I'm, I'm working in this section of the Lord's field and I'm just getting so discouraged. You know, uh, my, my, I'm getting sidetracked. I have so many things going on around me. And that time a brother or sister says, hey, let me come along and help you. Or, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling with this sin, pastor. Or I'm struggling with this sin, brother or sister. And, and you know, you don't hear people doing that anymore. And so they just hold on to their struggles with their sin and thinking they're all by themselves. They're isolated. Their their little ship is spinning around in the sea. But we're told as Christians to confess our sins to one another. And that doesn't mean just blatantly, you know, you develop a relationship with, this is what I'm struggling with. And it shouldn't then be broadcast, you know, throughout the church, you know, Bill is struggling with this sin. No. It's to meant to be pray in prayer for that person, to help them along, to come alongside. You know, and then you go back out and you work some more. Remember, there's no retirement for Christians. If you say, I've done my time, and when I used to be at First Baptist and the water commander, and we recruited people, I heard that over and over, I've done my time in youth ministries, I don't need to do it anymore. No, I'm sorry. 
God doesn't, there's a lady, Trace, how old is Sue? Like, like 117 or 120? Mid 70s. Mid 70s. Okay. And, and she's still doing the youth group and she will play with the kids. She is animated. She doesn't stop. And I think sometimes we get caught up and say, well, I've been here for this many years. Yeah, now I got to graduate. No. No, it's not the way it works. We work together. You're given a field. I'm giving fields. Where we may be working in the same field or different fields. But it's not our work. It's the Lord's work. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you, Lord, for the helpers that you've brought into our life um, at various stages um, or even today, Lord. We thank you for them, Lord. We thank you that you are our helper in times of trouble. Lord, let us never forget what you've done for us, where we're all through the past. And so when we go through other things in life, Lord, that we can look at the past and say, he was there to help me then. and My Lord is still in control. Father, give us eyes to see this coming week where we can help another. In your name, amen.